This is the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, a podcast brought to you by two physical therapists devoted to helping physical therapists and other healthcare providers become better educators to patients, students, the community, and each other by interviewing prominent and passionate people within the realms of healthcare and education. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast is intended literally for educational and entertainment purposes only. No clinical decision making should be based on only one source, and therefore this podcast should not be used as personal medical advice. While care has been taken to ensure accuracy, occasionally mistakes and factual errors can be present, as we are only human. This is our journey on the road to becoming better educators, so get ready with your pen and paper as class is about to begin. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, F. Scott Feel, and with me as always, my multi-talented co-host, Brandon Pone. And speaking of multi-talents, we have one of the most well-rounded individuals in the field of physical therapy that I think I've ever had the pleasure of meeting. Our guest tonight is Dr. Mark Milligan. Uh, Mark is an orthopedic manual therapist that specializes in the evaluation and treatment of musculoskeletal and spinal conditions, both acute and chronic. He's certified in therapeutic pain science, applied prevention and health promotion and dry needling, board certified in orthopedics, and a fellow of the American Academy of Orthopedic Manual Therapy. He earned his doctorate of physical therapy at the University of Colorado School of Medicine in Denver, Colorado. He went on to complete an orthopedic physical therapy residency and orthopedic manual physical therapy fellowship with Evidence in Motion. He's a full-time clinician and a founder of Revolution Human Health, a nonprofit physical therapy network, and he also founded a continuing education company specializing in microeducation. He's currently a physical therapist with Encompass Home Health in Austin, Texas. Dr. Milligan serves as an adjunct faculty for the Doctor of Physical Therapy programs at South College and University of St. Augustine. Dr. Milligan's also primary faculty for musculoskeletal courses for EIM. Mark has presented and spoken at numerous state and national conferences and has published in peer-reviewed journals. He's an active member of the TPTA, the APTA, and the AAOMPT, and is the current Capital Area District Chair for the Texas Physical Therapy Association and has a great interest in public health and governmental affairs. Basically, whenever I hear of something interesting or valuable going on in the field of physical therapy, I I start my research on it, and Mark Milligan is either heading it up or has already had his name at the top of the involvement list. So uh, tonight's show is actually an extra special one in that it involves a Twitter-style fundraiser where for every F-bomb dropped, Mark, Brandon, and I, as well as Jerry Durham, uh, who laid down this gauntlet of a challenge, will donate $5 to the Stand Haiti Project, and for every knowledge bomb dropped, we'll donate $2. This is going to be a no-holds-barred episode where we just kind of get Mark's take on some of the truths about life in general. So without further ado, away we go. Mark, thanks for coming on the show tonight. Uh, Realizing that we kept your bio relatively brief, uh, is there anything you'd like our audience to know about you that we've uh, not mentioned in your bio? Oh, Scott, thank you so much. I've got uh, Fail and Brandon Poen for having me. I'm going to start this podcast off with a fuck yeah in honor of Jerry Durham um, to get the first donation going to uh, Stand Haiti Project. Um, I, I really, it's an interesting thing when you, when you um, communicate someone's bio and when you stand by or when you listen to someone read about you, it's really, um, it makes me nauseous uh, because I'm, I, I'm not that type of person that wants um, that to be kind of the, the thing that leads me in um, because I think that there's more to a person than what's behind and and uh, what's written down about them. Does that make sense? Absolutely, man. That's why we give you this portion to now explain the real you. That's kind of your you know credentials yeah. and what you've earned and what you've done. Now, now this is your chance to give us the real you, man. The real me is really, um, it boils down to one thing. And the reason that I, the reason that see the the reason that my intro and that bio says the things that it says is really for one thing and one thing only, and that is uh, to to allow me or help me be the best provider that I can be for the patients that see me and the people that see me. That's it. Um, and I think that that's. Uh, the, that's my driver, um, and everything that I do for physical therapy and my and me as a professional is really try to allow me to be the best person that I can be for the person sitting in front of me who needs help. Plain and simple, I, I, I it doesn't boil down to anything more than that. Yeah, I think that's really admirable work. And I know before we kind of talked in the pre-show, 
you know, about all the things and stuff that you were kind of working on and stuff. To me, it just really seems that, you know, how you're doing that for every client and even what you're trying to do for a whole in general on a grand scheme is pretty, pretty quite remarkable. And, and I know you've done a lot with everything. And I know, as of course, Mark, you know that this show is strongly rooted in education and you've done a lot of it over the years. And do you think you could tell us a little bit about your continuing education company and kind of what are some of the things you were seeing out there that led you down that road? Well, I, there's a few things we can talk about there, Brandon. I think that's a great question. Um, I have I, I, I have an interesting path, right? I'm a non-traditional student. I started, I went back to school after being a personal trainer. I was an ACSM certified uh, personal trainer um, for quite a while and um, and really wanted to be further involved in patient care and really getting people back to where they could be further than what I was doing. And so I really investigated many different types of providers. I shadowed a physician. I shadowed a, I shadowed a DO. I shadowed a chiropractor. Um, I, I shadowed some uh, um, other uh, nurse prac. I, sh- I shadowed a physician assistant. <clears throat> I really tried to figure out my path in healthcare the best that I could before I really hammered down. And physical therapy just made the most sense um, with the amount of uh, education required, the doctoral degree, uh, the terminal degree, the um, uh, and the biggest thing was seeing transition over time and being with patients as they improve, seeing that improvement, um, and also the time spent with the patient, right? Of all the people that I shadowed, a physical therapist spent more time with any uh, patient or more time with any patient than any other provider that I that I spent time with. And it really resonated with me. And also seeing that patients change over time and how um, the inter- interaction really had an impact on, that li- uh, on the patient's life, that really sung uh, a big, it was just, it resonated. It was the perfect fit. So um, transitioning into PT, I was uh, really a, an aggressive student. So I hammered down, uh, finished undergrad in three and a half years, went straight into PT school, straight into residency, straight into fellowship, straight, I mean, just, just hammered through everything really aggressively. So my education experience was, um, relatively recent, um, but also really aggressive. And so uh, the things that I noticed and what I saw from an educational standpoint is that really it's, it's, you have to have a foundation you have to have a, a, a really amazing foundation of the basic sciences and the basic information that you can build on. And then the second thing that you really need to have is critical thinking skills that allow you to both appraise the information that you're receiving from other people, but then also critically appraise and, and apply that information to you as an individual, and then also a, clinically appraise and apply that information to the patient. And so, because there's a, a lot of crap out there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of bullshit out there. There's a lot of people selling stuff and a lot of people, uh, you know, wanting to make some cash on information and knowledge and, and frame things in a way that make what they're selling the best. And, and really, um, I think that, uh, what I try to differentiate in, in the education kind of continuum that I bring is a, is a clinical reasoning side that's, that, um, is a paramount part of it. Right, I, you don't. I don't. I try not to teach interventions or uh, you know a tool for the toolkit. Worst term in physical therapy, but that can be another por- a podcast. But really, teach a, a, a framework for kind of thinking through a process, analyzing information, and then applying it to the patient. Long-winded answer for a short, uh, short answer there. Yeah, no, definitely. That's a that's a good point. I think, Mark. Uh, there is a lot of bullshit out there, and I think it's it's you really have to do your due diligence to, to weed through it and kind of sift through it and figure out, you know, what is worth my time and money and effort um, when it comes to continuing ed stuff for sure. Um, Mark, you and I crossed paths at CSM this year briefly down in San Antonio there. Um, and since then, you've really inspired me to try to get involved in helping Texas obtain direct access. Um, I'm not really a political minded, you know, individual. I don't know too much about what goes on higher up. So that's why I kind of pay my APTA dues and hope that, you know, the right people will take that money and allocate it to the right, you know, fight. So could you maybe tell our audience who isn't aware uh, what direct access means and, you know, basically how physical therapists in the state of Texas or any of the states that that still don't have direct access need to go about advocating for direct access and, and why it's absurd to not already have it. Beautiful point. Beautiful point. I don't, um, it's really a topic that, um, 
it, it, it stirs a few different emotions in me. One is primarily one of just uh, of kind of an anger, right? I get really frustrated and angry that patients don't have, a, have access to physical therapy in Texas without a referral. And because really, I think it boils down to a fundamental restriction of choice for a patient, right? Uh, if you flip this, right, I think a, a big argument is that uh, many providers for many years say, oh, it, it restricts my trade, you know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't allow me to see patients, it, it hinders my business, it hinders my ability to see patients, um, and I really think that that's, that's fucking bullshit, right? That's not what it's about. It, 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 that, that, there's a spin there, but it's really coming from the person who's crying that song. What really is fundamentally missing when it comes to access in Texas, is a fundamental right for a patient to choose to see a therapist for their care, right? In Texas, a patient can see literally anybody they want to see. They could see someone that hits them with hot rocks. They could see someone that blesses them with a feather. They could see someone who does massage. They could see a personal trainer. They could see um, a Reiki healer. They could see their uh, their cognitive behavioral therapist. They can literally ask their neighbor for advice on what's going on with their body. The only licensed provider for in Texas that they can't see is a physical therapist for their back pain. And it just it's it's socially unacceptable for a patient to be denied the right to choose the best provider for musculoskeletal care in this country from a patient seeing that provider. It's, 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 it's just socially unacceptable. I don't know if that nails it on the head, but right now in Texas, you, can, you have to have a referral to see a patient, uh, to see a, a PT from a, a, an MD, a DC, a podiatrist, a dentist, um, or a nurse practitioner who's underneath the, the supervision of a physician. It just, it's, it's, it's extremely restrictive from a standpoint of a patient being able to access the care they need when they need it. Yeah, and even if, even if physical therapy wasn't their best bet, I still feel like the patient should have that choice to go that route first if that's who they want and that's who they trust. and that Because at the very least, as physical therapists, we do a pretty damn good job of forwarding people to other, other providers if we feel we can't help them. Agreed. You know, so if they trust us enough to come, get an evaluation, see what's going on, maybe a few treatments, it's not working all right, we got to try something else. You know, that should be their right. That should be their choice. Um, you know, but so so tell us more. Tell us a little bit about like what what should we do then? How do we advocate for it? How, what you know what what do we do as clinicians or as as your everyday PT? Beautiful. Uh, I mean, I think that your point you just made it, it is. I think that physical therapists are great in referring, right? Physical therapists are great at you know at screening out what they can and can't treat and referring to the appropriate provider. I think that that's that's been demonstrated in the literature across the entire country. Um, uh, I think as a provider, what needs to be done or what can be done, that's a really difficult question because we've been fighting access in the state of Texas for almost two decades now, right? Um, for 20 years almost that we've had some type... I'm hearing things as, as intense as, you know, running for a position or in office or even bringing up legal action against the state, like... You know, are, are these realistic options? I think so. I think that I think there's a few things that need to happen. One, there needs to be some type of public awareness. So where the people rise up and fight for a demand, right? Because the people saying, hey, I can't see, I can't practice, I can't do this, I can't. That's not going to really be the driver of change. I think the driver of change needs to come from patients demanding the right to see a physical therapist first. I think that that's a really empirical thing because we can push our own name and prop ourselves up on our own shoulders all day long. But until some, until the constituents and the people that drive the change are heard or need to have a voice, that's, that's when it's going to really change. Secondly, I think PTs need to get involved in a few different ways. First is you got to give money to the pack, right? You got to, you, it is our obligation as professionals to give money to the professional organization that supports us as, and our license, right? The political action funds in every state and the APTA in the state level, their job is to protect our scope of practice and protect what we do as professionals across this country. So there's a duty there. Secondly, PTs need to get involved, right? The AMA have lobbyists in every place. They have 
They they have structured roles and even even early identifications of people that they want to identify that that can be involved in the political process. Um, the 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 APTA and the TPTA need to do that as well. We need to early identify people that can have possible political runs and fund them. We need to support them and we need to put them in places where they can have a voice and a seat at the actual legislative table when it comes to both writing legislation and voting on it. And we're missing that. We're missing that badly. Another way that we can get involved is actually um, is volunteering your time with your local association when it comes to that legislative session and a legislative time to dedicate yourself. Right? We're not going to get things changed over, you know, the legislative session, Brandon and I were talking about this before um, we started this, this kickoff. You know, Texas... Texas is a, it's a large state, right? We're one of four states that still have a legislative session every two years. Only four. And, you know, the other three are Montana, Nevada, and North Dakota. Really, I mean, not a lot of population there. Not very big states. No offense. Love, love, the, love those states. But really, they have nowhere near the volume of people um, nor the size that Texas has. And yet we have our legislative session every other year. It makes absolutely no sense. And so basically, we're starting fresh every two years with our legislative session. And my point with this is that people have to be engaged and pushing access and, and fundraising and getting involved with their legislators for the entire two years. You can't just jump on board two months before a legislative session and expect change to happen. It has to happen year round and it has to be an aggressive push. I mean, the TMA in Texas has an entire quarter of a block with a seven story building that's just for lobbying and the TMA and they have regular people there every every week they're lobbying on Capitol Hill. We have to come in force and in mass in order to make a change. Yeah, Mark, and I think you bring up a couple of really important points in that regard in terms of what we need to do. And I'm going to go back to your first point here that you said in terms of getting the the population or the people to kind of fight for us. And I think that ideally is a good thing. The only problem with that I see, at least, and I mean, I'd love to hear your guys' take, but at least from the biggest thing I worry I have is that not a lot of people know what we do. Yeah. And, and I think we need to do a better job personally at getting out to the community more to raise awareness, not only for, you know, population health and preventative services of such, but and by through doing that, educating the public on what we do. Because I can't tell you how many people that I see every day when I evaluate a patient, they have no idea what PT is. So I, I definitely think that we need to do more to address that component. Otherwise, I'm not sure how much the people are going to really fight for us for that regard if they don't know who we are. Yeah, fucking right, Brandon. I mean, of any profession that's out there, physical therapists have one of the worst branding of, of any health professionals, right? I mean, you, you think of any other health professionals, a nurse, a physician, a nurse practitioner, an acupuncturist, a massage therapist. I mean, those professions are very delineated and they're, and they're specific in your mind. When you say physical therapist, it really boils down, I mean, conceptually to the experience that that person has had with physical therapy. There is no national brand. You're right. And I think it's really v quite variable what a patient will say too, because sometimes they'll say, well, we did some hands on, so we did some exercise, but then you also get, well, we just did Eastim, a hot, and then ultrasound. And then you're like, oh, oh boy. And there's just such that wide variability. <laughs> yeah, totally. Not only in treatment paradigms, but also in experiences. Some people, some people have only pediatric physical therapy experience. Some people only have post-operative, you know, physical therapy experience. Some people only have inpatient physical therapy experiences. Some people only have women's health, pelvic floor, exp you know, outpatient experience. There is no universal experience for physical therapy other than how awesome we are at making pa patient connections and how awesome we are at developing relationships. Other than that, this would be a good survey is to ask what PT means to 150 people off the street and see what they have to say. Because I guarantee you there's probably going to be about 100 different opinions on there. I fucking totally agree. I, I could totally see that happening, man. I, I think you're right. <laughs> I, think, I think you're right. I mean, <laughs> I, based on what I see every day, and Scott, I'm curious what your take is as well, but I mean... Yeah, I, I see a lot of them that just don't have any clue or they're like, well, my doctor told me this or they said this. And I'm like, oh, that's not what I'm going to be doing. But. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I, I've gotten pretty sick of hearing the fact that, you know, the public doesn't know what we do amongst our own profession. 
Yeah. You know, I've heard that so much the last two, three years that I'm, I'm actually releasing a uh, free online webinar about 10, 15 minutes long. It should be ready in the near future, literally just explaining what physical therapy is. And it's going to be free to the public. You know, I, I just here, take it, share it, please. It's a it's a great profession. I loved it. I, it's it's treated me well, um, you know, and, and I would love to give back to it. So. You know, here's what I do for a living. You know, here, here's, here's the many different avenues that you can get into. And hopefully it'll help some new grads who are thinking about PT head that way. You know, hopefully it'll restructure and, and help others who are in specific niches kind of figure it out and, and, and realize that it is a bigger, grander thing. And hopefully it'll help educate the public as to, you know, hey, that's what they do. Okay. I mean, we got to start somewhere, but I'm just getting sick of hearing it. So I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm putting a course together. Like I said, it should be out pretty soon here. Uh, we got to start somewhere. So that's, that's my effort at, at point A, at starting, taking the first step. Yeah. No, I love it, man. I think I think that's great, Scott. And you know, and Mark, kind of going back to um, the issues we I know we were before we were kind of talking about direct access and what we need to do from an advocacy standpoint to that for that. But I'm kind of curious, Mark, if you know kind of where we stand on some of these other issues that are kind of facing PT. I'm sure you've heard of some of the newer developments with um, dry needling in certain states, thrust manipulation in certain states, and you know, a couple interventions that are you know, allowed in some states and not. And I'm just curious overall, you know, on what your thoughts and our opinions of and how we need to overall advocate for those techniques, if we need to do it differently, or if we need to just do the same thing, just apply it in a different way. Or I'm just curious and kind of what your thoughts are on that to be the most effective. Yeah, Brandon. I mean, that's a great question. And there's so many layers to that. And to go back, Scott, awesome on that video. I can't wait to watch it. I think that's an important part of what needs to happen is public education. Um, and, and I agree. I'm also sick of, of hearing about our brand awareness. Um, but I think the point that I'm about to make really kind of circles back to that, um, is that physical therapists and our attitude and our total kill each other kind of mantra, and, and we're, we're, we're killing ourselves. And, and Brandon, it kind of crosses that question about what we need to do about looking at different things that are happening across different states. I mean, uh, the infighting in the, in the realm of physical therapy um, is, is, is disgusting. <laughs> I mean, there's really no other way to put it. I think um, to get, if, we can't, if we can't come together as a, as, a, as a unified front for our profession and support each other, We'll never get any grounds in the public realm. True that. We continuously chew each other up. We spit each other out. Um, we hold each other to an extremely high standard. We hold other people to a higher standard and then practice at a lower standard when the people aren't looking. We're not, we, 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 are, we are of a scarcity mindset. And we are literally destroying people and their ideas and their in, intuition and their initiative and their desire to be in this profession and new grads and, and people are getting getting pretty sick of it. And so Brandon, to your initial point, like how do we approach the stuff that's happening state by state for different scopes of practice like dry needling and manipulation and all this stuff? How do we approach that? We first, my suggestion is we got to, we have to come together as a profession. We've got to find a common ground and understand fundamentally that none of us know anything, but we have to support everybody in what they're doing, right? Nobody, nobody can claim to know what's happening. Nobody knows the answers to everything. Nobody knows the exact underlying physiology of why a mobilization works, but a manip doesn't, or vice versa, or what's happening physiologically on a, neuro, a, yeah. a neuromuscular level of dry needling, or what's happening when you just talk to somebody cognitively and... and 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 the top down mechanisms happen from the brain and the neurochemicals and trans like we all have to be okay with ambiguity and stand on that ambiguity and support each other. Yeah, and I Mark, I think a little positivity goes a long way too. Like you said, the uh, yeah. in, in profession fighting is is pretty much gotten absurd at this point. So you know, it's it's up to us as individuals to just you know, be the bigger person and, and, and just try to shed a little positivity in the world. Not even the profession, man, just, it's a great field. You know, we get to help people at the end of the day. You've, you've just got to stay positive, you know? Right. I mean, plain and simple, you know? Yeah. And Scott, I think the biggest thing, a lot of things that happen on social media, right? We assume 
we make a really large assumption that the people reading the posts and the stuff that happened on social media that are just professionals. And I don't think people really understand the fact that I have like, I don't know, 1,200 people that are on my Facebook feed and, you know, so many people are on Twitter and then you have that many and that, that uh, and, and that's public domain for information that happens where people question things and really get a, you know, a, 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 it really demonstrates publicly the infighting and the questioning and the, the doubt that's cast on when when we doubt, uh, cast out on our own colleagues about what they're doing and how they're treating, um, we have that that cast out on us as a profession, and I don't think people are really realizing that. Yeah, for sure. I've I've pretty much uh, stopped interacting with a lot of uh, PTs, not, not not because I dislike them or I don't agree with what they're saying or disagreeing, but I feel like my purpose and my call can be kind of better serviced if I'm promoting the you know the things that I know and the the education that I've gotten to the general public you know and just trying to increase people's healthcare literacy to help them out on their journey um yeah you know some things work some things don't some things work for one person some things don't for that same person so i mean you know i, I i'm good with the ambiguity man let's just push on and like take the best possible evidence and the best possible knowledge we have and just kind of use it for good um and try to educate people like hey this is what's going on this is what they're finding maybe try this if it doesn't work try this you know if that doesn't work go to this guy like you know it's a very simple simple algorithm that if we just kind of follow the path man we you know like i said we should be okay yeah um, but Mark, I want to change directions a little bit here, man. I, I have to talk about this hashtag that I see <laughs> loosely connected with your name. Um, it's the hashtag GSD. Um, now you and I were involved in a fierce competition over the summer called summer of move put on by Mike Eisenhart's free the yoke. Right. And we all know that team M Quattro led by our fearless leader, Jerry Durham took home the championship for the major league, but, but it was Team GSD, led by none other than Mark Milligan, who won the minor league championship. So I, I've got two questions for you here. One, when are you going to move up to the big leagues? And two, how do you do such a damn good job of living up to your GSD team name and literally getting shit done? Because, like I said, not only are you one of those guys involved in everything, but you're doing it all with relative success. And I'm sure our audience would like to know the secret. So go ahead, drop a knowledge bomb on us. All right, so first of all, Shout out to Jerry Durham and his work with Team M Quattro. That man is a social media king. I mean, considering he, uh, I think just yesterday, today's Tuesday, so Monday morning, Jerry Durham crossed the 140,000 tweet mark, which is just insane. Um, so big shout out to him. Big shout out to Mike Eisenhart for organizing the Free the Yoke um, because uh, that's inspiring in and of itself. Um, I don't know when we're going to step up in the minor leagues. I like... I like the options of the minor leagues because it's really it's a, it's pure to me. Minor leagues are just a pure a pure chance for people to get together without any kind of of hierarchy or sw or you know trades or anything like that. Where it's just you know it's just people that get together and and work hard. And the team that came together with uh, Team GSD this year was exceptional. Um, there were there were three people: uh, Connie and then Mariana. Uh, that are two people, Car uh, uh, Mariana and Connie, that just destroyed it, and um, and I just I just happened to be a part of uh, of them together with me, and it was awesome. So the, the the lesson of that is that you surround yourself with good people, and good people and good things will happen, right? The one of the biggest lessons of my life is that it, you need to surround the people, surround yourself with the people that you want to be, right? Um, and that will allow you and give you the path to reach the vision of what you think you should be. Um, and I, I can't stress that enough, right? I mean, I has the hashtag GSD of getting shit done is fucking, it's, 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 it's really simple. The, the way that I get shit done in a day is that I love what I'm doing and it's not work. It's enjoyment. Yep. And, and sitting down, you know, today, I mean, today for me started at 4.55 this morning with exercise, with two phone calls, patient care, two meetings, a meeting with a local physician, um, a phone call with some colleagues in Arizona, then back home, dinner with family, and then back on this call with you guys, right? I mean, it was a, it's, a, it's a pretty heavy day considering there was 
a lot of patients treated in between and a lot of others. And so getting shit done is something that you have to not only want to do, but you enjoy doing. Because quickly, if you put too many tasks on your plate, getting shit done will bury you. Another part of, of the life of getting shit done is really just saying yes without any expectation on the back end, right? Too many people, including myself, started off in this profession assuming that, that my time was valuable. And I assumed that what I did, I needed to get compensated for, and I needed my recognition, and I needed the, 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 the kudos, and I needed the you know, attaboys in order for me to feel like I'm really given something. And I, you, I quickly realized that all of that shit was just about me. And getting over the fact that you need something in return other than your own self sense of satisfaction and enjoyment and gratitude to yourself, that's what is the driver for the GSD behind it. If you look for outward gratification and outward support, you're going to constantly get beat down, right? The, the, the gratitude and the, the enjoyment and the satisfaction has to come within, from within or you'll, you'll burn yourself out right out of GSD. Simple as that. Man, that's a, that's a fucking good point there, Mark. And I think that's a really important thing for our audience, our listeners to hear on that. Cause, and I think even too realizing to, to the individual, what, what really are they passionate about or what are they excited with? You know, what are the things that get them? Because, you know, we all might have slightly different things that make us passionate and then verif- in, in those regards that will kind of change how we look at things. So I think that's a great point with that, Mark. And thanks for that, man. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, of course. And the other thing about GSDN is you just, you know, you put yourself, going back to the first point of surrounding yourself with people and greatness, um, you surround yourself with the people that you want to be or the positions that you want to be in and understand there's a few levels here. One, you just have to say yes and do it, right? Regardless of the, regardless of whether you're gonna get paid for it, compensated for it, you'll you'll get experience for it. Like there's so many different layers of why you say yes to something. One, you assume that you'll just be a billionaire the next day and it'll be done. You can retire, but you can't. That always doesn't happen. Um, so you have to you have to know that there's different levels and different ways that you are compensated for. And with your time, experience is extremely valuable, especially in the education realm, right? You don't get to teach unless you've taught before. And often your beginning to teach starts with giving your time away in ways that you're that you don't expect it, right? It's little lectures here, it's little lectures there, it's coming in and doing a guest lecture here, volunteering your time. It, it's not about you, you know, you land a, a teaching gig, you're first you're right out of, of school. You have to kind of earn the ability and learn how to do it. You have to teaching is a learned experience, right? And then you have to also when you're GSDN, you have to like you have to be humble and you have to be teachable and you have to be open to the experience. Um too many people want to craft an experience for them. You know, if I'm gonna go, you know, do this residency or I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna take this job at this clinic, I expect this to happen, this to happen, this to happen, and this to happen, and really have really clear, defined parameters for what they expect out of it, which is a, not a bad thing. It can't be the only thing that drives that experience, right? Because, again, taking us out of it, it, it can't be about you. It's got to be about the other people around you, the experience, and giving yourself up to that, right? Lowering your own expectations and really taking the experience for what it is that happens versus trying to command that experience into something that you expect, it's kind of heady, but once you do that, everything kind of the way you look at things change. Yeah, no, interesting. I think that's a great to- great point on that one, Mark. And I think that's something that's very, something that I'll have to reflect on as well and think of it that way because I'll, I'll rise to the challenge on that one and give that a try. So, Mark, I know that there's probably a few things here that we could go in this next question here, but... But Mark, what do you feel are some good avenues of revenue or some niche areas of practice that you feel that today's physical therapists are really missing out on and and the ones that new graduates would be smart to get on board with shortly after graduating to really cash in and kind of make an impact? No, oh, that's a great question, Brandon. I think there's a few avenues there. One, well, I mean, that's hard to answer considering the current insurance environment and healthcare environment. Um, I think that 
there's a lot of different directions to go there. Uh, one, I think new grads coming out of school need to get extremely competent in technology. Um, and I think that's something that uh, there's a few people starting to touch this, but we need to be really good at, at leveraging technology to further our profession, whether that be through uh, advertising, whether that be through uh, data collection, whether that be through um, creating and developing software, whether that be uh, working within networks and, and looking at value-based care through outcomes. Um, we, we really, whether that be through telehealth and, and different platforms of that nature, we need to be and change our attitude towards technology and be early adapters versus really uh, uh, sh like shunning that type of information. I think that's the, one of the biggest things out there because the data is supporting that physical appointments and physical time with a provider will probably decrease over the next, you know, 15 to 20 years. And we need to be good at, at, uh, at, at adapting to that. Um, secondly, does that make sense, Brandon? Yeah, no, it, it totally does. And yeah, I'm, I'm kind of getting a hint of telehealth creeping in a little bit here. I think it will. I think there's no doubt. Uh, if you look at the data that was projected, um, there for primary care, uh, visits they're looking at an 80 percent by the year 2015 to 2020 they're looking at 80 or 2020 to 2025 they're looking at a, a 50 to 80 percent increase in in telehealth visits for primary care physicianship so i think that there's going to be an aspect of our care that's going to go towards the telehealth market no doubt so we have to be ready for that and whether that be follow-ups check-ins you know you know, watching somebody walk or, you know, talking about their exercise program, communicating with them about their fears. It doesn't have to be manual skill hands-on, but it's going to, there's going to be some aspect of our follow-up that's going to go telehealth and that we have to be open to it and, and embrace it. Second thing that PTs need to do in the world of physical therapy is we need to embrace prevention more than reaction care, right? Preventive, preventative care is the future of healthcare. Yes. Right? So I presented and submitted a talk for for South by Southwest, South by Southwest this year hasn't haven't heard back whether it's accepted or not. Um, but really, it's about uh, the four bit largest killers in our in our society, and um, and how movement can impact those four things, uh, those four those four different disease processes. We die more Americans die of preventable or modifiable health conditions than anything else in this country. The answer, the root answer to the healthcare crisis in our country right now is prevention. That's it. Amen. No, amen, Mark. I totally fucking agree with you. I think that's spot on, and and I <laughs> applaud at what you're doing. You've been you've been doing through your, you know, through your pitch and everything, and your work thus far with you know APHPT and such. And I think, you know, listening to them and to Mike Eisenhardt and some of the others as well, and how we're trying to adapt to that and how to push that forward. I I agree. I think that that is the method, and I think I think that's definitely what the overall the country does need and. And I know Mike's been really good with teaching about how to actually do incorporate that model and still and also still survive financially, right. you know, as well because there's definitely a market for it. And I think a lot of things that a lot of people are worried about is, I hate to say this, but oh well, insurance isn't going to cover that, or they're not going to go that route. Well, you know, there's other ways you can do it. You know, I mean, we've I think we've got to learn now that insurance is not going to be the answer to this. Actually, we I think we've got to get away from it in the future or, you know, it's going to be unsustainable. But that that's a totally different topic for another day. I'm not trying to. Go, but no, those are some good points there, Mark. Yeah, the statistics are, are agree with you, Brandon. Like the, the current model of insurance based care is not sustainable. Like there's no there's no ifs, ands or buts about it. And so it's about how it plays out. Um, but what we can do as a profession, a profession is start to demonstrate the value of health and you know humans are weird man we're really we're really fucked up in our heads because we know stuff is bad for us then we know things that we can do can change those things and yet unless there is some type of aha moment or some slap in the face or some dramatic change or some huge intervention we rarely change our path. Yeah, I, I can attest to that, Mark. I, I've I've had several slaps to the face and and did nothing about it until just recently. I mean, literal life changing. Like my dad basically died of several uh, 
chronic diseases that eventually ended up to a heart blockage. Uh, he threw an embolism while on the table, and it was too much for his body. He couldn't come back from it, right? I'm sorry, bro. Again, it was obesity, it was diabetes, it was, uh, you know, just every preventable disease that you can imagine, right? And you would think that would be enough of a wake-up call to, like, change my habits. Didn't do it, right? Have my first child, you think, all right, you want to live a long life, you want to be there. Nope didn't do anything to change my habits, right? My wife, she's type one diabetic. You would think, all right, you know, got to be healthy. You got to stay and eat right and do the right things. That would change my habit. Nope. Still didn't change my habits. Finally, it took the birth of my second uh, kid, right? My son, my wife had, uh, her blood pressure was elevated. It was about 200 over 100 and they had to induce a month early, you know, and the the baby was fine and, and she ended up being fine as well. But it was literally that one thing that like, threw me over the edge and was like, you know, heaven forbid something happens to her. I need to be there as well. I want to see graduations. I want to see marriages and weddings and I want to see them grow up to be successful adults, you know? And so I'm literally taking a a daily vitamin and omega three and one blood pressure medication. And that has been my goal for the last two years is trying to get off that blood pressure medication. And finally I'm at the point where I'm at the lowest dosage possible. I go in next month for, for a checkup. And if everything's all good, my levels are all good. He's going to remove me from it. So, you know, it's been an uphill battle from basically my entire life. Um, but it's finally starting to trend the right way. And it's just about, like you said, surrounding yourself with the right people, you know, striving toward a goal that's more prevention and wellness, uh, related and, and just trying to learn for my patients as well. Like, Hey, look, I've been on this journey with you, man. I know it's hard. I know it's not easy, but here's the steps I'm taking you know, take that for what you will. Maybe it'll help you. Maybe it won't. But, you know, I, I know how hard it is. I can relate. I, I'm literally in your shoes. So, you know, we need to start, you know, taking ownership of our own health and, and really trying to make, you know, the right decisions uh, moving forward. So good point. Yeah, so you're totally right on that one, Scott. And I, I think that's the absolute truth, man. And I applaud you for all the stuff that you've worked on that in that regard. And I'm, I'm happy for you. Congrats. I hope that goes well, man. And and I think even too, just finding that wake up call. And I think some of us, I mean, this is sometimes what I do as well. I, it's in the back of my mind, but I'm like, oh, it'll be fine. It won't, it won't work a little, it won't cause a problem or anything like that. But I feel like, you know, we as PTs are in a good position that we can, like, we spend more time with our patients. We get more, we get good rapport with our patients. We're able to see patient progression over a long term. You know, we're able to implement these little acts of health and less into it, you know, for nutrition, sleep, how we look at stress, exercise and movement. And I even think so, like a lot of these patients, they know it, like they know it deep down. They know they got to change, but a lot of them are nervous to change because they don't know. And plus they want to make sure that they've got someone to guide them to, that they can go to because they're a lot of them, my patients tell me they look online for all the stuff and they see all this different knowledge and stuff and they don't know who to believe. And then, then they kind of get confused and then they just kind of stop trying. So I, I think that if we're in a trusted role where we can really make a, we are in a position that we can really make a positive role and really make an impact because of what we can do. So, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, Scott. I mean, Scott, I, I really appreciate you sharing your story and especially about your family and your dad and your wife and your kids. That's what makes change. That's what drives change. I, and I thank you for that. And I applaud your sharing of your your path and also the changes that you've 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 taken upon yourself to to make because no one else can do that but you as you know that and um and my path was similar right my dad died at 57 of cancer um you know i went from racing bikes in colorado at 173 pounds when i was my racing weight to undergrad to pt school to moving across the country to my dad passing away to having to getting married to having a child to a new career to a residency fellowship and I put on 100 pounds in 10 years and I was sitting in my aha moment was I was in the clinic and um and I looked myself in the mirror and somebody had asked about a video I'd taken of my daughter so I I I showed this video and um of her playing in the backyard and I'm just and I'm showing this video, and in the video you couldn't really hear my daughter playing, but you could just hear me breathing. And I was like, you could hear me wheezing on camera, and the the you know I was holding it out at arm's length, but you could hear me breathing. <laughs> and I was like, that's not right. Like I'm gonna, I was 278 pounds, and you could hear me breathing on camera. I was like, I need to be there for my daughter to live. 
right? It, it, there was an aha moment. And since then, you know, I'm 80 pounds lighter than I was then, right? Almost two and a half years into it. But it, it, there's that click, something happens in a person that drives that change. Yeah. Good point, Mark. I mean, it's, 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 it's crazy though. Like to, like you said that, no matter how much info we throw at people, there has to be that change. There has to be that click. It has to, the light bulb has to go on yeah. you know, and that has to happen for every individual. Absolutely. And they have to have that willingness to change as well. Totally. I agree, Brandon. So what, how do we, how do we as professionals find that click, right? What do we do? How do, that's the question. Well, and that's the thing. What, what makes it harder is that the click is different for everybody. I mean, it's a different driver it's a different motivator for everyone so i think given our a large amount of time with patients over long periods of time with patients is a good platform for us to find that motivation find that click in everybody that's the answer and i think that's what pts are scared of doing and that's what we're not doing now right people come in people come in they get on the ube they warm up they you know you get on the shoulder and you're you're cranking out the shoulder you know, they may smell like cigarettes, but you don't really talk about it. You know, they may be overweight, but you don't talk about it. You know, they may have high blood pressure, but you don't know that because you didn't check their vitals when they first came into the fucking clinic, right? We're not, we're afraid. We're not taking the steps. We're not engaging patients as they should be engaged to maximize their benefit. Agree. And I think even so, I mean, at the end of the day too, I mean, there are some people that you work with and you really try to get to know in that regard. And some of them just still won't change regardless of how much time and effort you put in. Like they're just not ready for that step. Like, you know what? I'm saying this and we've kind of got to the bottom of knowing what's going on. And I just don't think they're in the position to be able to hear that. And I've learned that's okay. Because you know what? They're going to go through their life. They're going to they're gonna find something else. They're going to be like, oh, you know what? I think maybe that guy was right. Yeah. You know, I didn't see it at the time or maybe I wasn't ready for it at the time, but it's like, you know, even if I could just plant that seed in you right? and you're actually willing to consider it down the road to make a change in your regard, like it doesn't have to be today or this course of care. And that's something for me that I've struggled with coming out of school, Mark. Like I, I'd meet these people that just weren't ready to make a change and I really uh, internally hit, let that hit me. Oh, you yeah. know, I'm like, what did I not do? Did I not play it right? Did I not build it up right? Did I not dig into all those questions? Did I not, yeah. was I too strong? Was I not strong enough? And then, you know, at the end of the day, I've kind of learned to accept that, you know, some people you just can't, it's just not the right time for them. And, you know, you just got to plant the seed and then later you see them and then they come back and they're like, you're like, oh, now you're ready to change now. And you can just tell in the eval now, you're like, this person's ready to make a change. Yeah, Brandon, that's a beautiful, beautiful, there's so many things in that statement that you just made that are extremely important. One is that you get, you, you're not, we're not, so, I mean, as a, as a new grad, you want to change people. You want to be the person that they see that makes a difference in their life, that takes away their pain. We're the superhero, right? We want to be the savior. That's what we came, that's why we're in the medical field, right? To help people get better? Yeah, that's the point. Fuck yeah, it is. Fuck yeah, it is, but that's, that's not what happens. <laughs> That's the crazy thing about that's not what happens. We're not we're that's not our role. Our role is to walk with people on their journey of their healthcare and get them to the best place that they can be at the time that they are there with you. It's not our goal, it's not our role to be a hero. It's not our role to be to save people. It's our role is to walk with people and support them on their path of, re, of, of, of getting back to the life where they need to be at, at the best that we can do to help them get there. And so the crazy thing, I mean, and that's, if you can think about patient care fundamentally differently in that vein, all of your stress about that person changing and that person being different and you, may not, and you not making an impact in their life, all of that goes out the window. Because it takes the responsibility of change off of your shoulders and places it on the patients where it should be, right? The only person responsible for a patient's change is the patient, not you as a provider. And the earlier you can see that and adapt that and adopt that as your mantra, the more, the less burnout you'll have, the less patient fatigue you'll have, the less frustration you'll have, the less wow. everything yeah. you'll have because you put the onus on the patient yep. for their recovery, not you. Yeah, that's that's a great fucking point, Mark. I mean, 
this has been such an amazing episode. It really has. And I'm so glad we got to have you on here, but um, we, we like to end each episode with this final question, right? Uh, we ask all of our guests, if you could change one aspect of higher education, DPT or otherwise, what would it be and how? It should be free. Fuck yes. <laughs> Amen, brother. There Amen. we go. Amen. <laughs> I mean, there's no other way to put it. I mean, the education, our society dr is driven by education that helps other people survive. We need to be doing this in order for our society to continue as it is in perpetual, because it won't if we don't. Yeah, or, you know, the big worry there, too, is they're all going to go to different professions and not PT. Right. I mean, I'm talking about any profession. Like, we sh like there's, <laughs> there's no reason um, why... Why in higher education couldn't be uh, couldn't be free? I mean, the knowledge is uh, knowledge is something that yeah. There's an entire sociological debate that we can have there and discussion about about access to to knowledge and but really it boils down to the fact that in PT if we if we take it physical therapy specific, I think a, th a few things need to happen. One, you got to cut the cost of physical therapy school. There's no reason to charge that much other than admin and overhead. It's a bunch of bullshit. And two, uh, there needs to be integrated paid residencies at the at the end of, of PT school. We have to have, I think there needs to be, and I, this movement is going that way where we need to have some type of specialization, whether it be a, g a general practitioner versus an orthopedist versus a, neuro a, ne a neuro specialist. Um, but that needs to be a paid learning experience Um where you both are valued for your time and you get value for your time. That needs to happen in NPT. Yeah, Mark, I couldn't agree with you more on that. I think that's a big topic and I, I agree. And I think the, I think the, it's a very complex issue, of course, in the realm. And I'm, I'm by no means, I by no means know what's actually a hundred percent going on in that realm, but I agree. I think that's a big point. And, you know, I think that's a great point, Mark. And, you know, Mark, first of all, you know, Thanks so much for coming on the show, man, and all the fucking amazing bombs that we were able to drop tonight, man. And and I, I learned definitely some new stuff, especially earlier. I'm going to definitely take what you said and really reflect on that and really apply that more from now on and kind of see how that one goes. But, you know, for our audience who's kind of looking to find you, Mark, where can people find you online and on social media? All right. So, uh, first of all, Brandon, Scott, I, th I appreciate you guys having me here. Um, it's really it's humbling to be a part of, of your guys' conversation and what you guys are building as a platform. I, I applaud it. You guys are awesome for doing it and putting yourself out there. Part of uh, the, G, the, the, the term GSD is you actually got to get shit done and you guys are doing that. Um, half the battle of being part of that team is actually showing up and doing something. Most people don't do anything because they're afraid of failure. Um, and so you guys are actually doing something, so you will never fail. That's the beautiful thing. Um, on uh, social media wise, it's just Mark Milligan DPT uh, on Twitter. Same thing on uh, on just Mark Milligan on Facebook. I, I haven't uh, delved into uh, any other social media venues, and so uh, that's the only two places you'll find me. You can email me at markmilligandpt at gmail dot com. And just search me out. I'm here as a resource for anybody and everybody who uh, has a question about anything we talked about tonight or the or the world of physical therapy. I'm definitely just an open book and want to be a resource for, for anybody else and support people in the path that I've walked and, uh, and, and help patients have better care uh, when they interact with physical therapists. Awesome. We'll have to tally up the uh, F-bombs and the knowledge bombs and... Uh... All, all proceeds will end up going to Stand Haiti. So thank thank all you guys for getting involved on this. And Jerry Durham as well. Yeah, Jerry Durham better pay up. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think how, how many, how many think how many F bombs do you think we went through? Probably about I think about eight or nine. Not too many. I'm yeah, I'm gonna guess around ten to twelve, 10 to 12. maybe ish. I'm we'll see. All right. We'll see. I don't know. Well, I mean I'll I'll definitely have to tell you it up and let let us know and then I'll post the the dollar amount and such and then we'll definitely send that to justin and morgan yeah we'll have to give one more fuck in there for it so uh support haiti well fuck yeah we will so all right but thank you guys <laughs> so much for coming on with everything and we'll see you guys next time all right thank you thank you for attending class today and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content if you'd like to schedule office hours with us feel free to add us on twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, 
the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, healthcareeducationtransformationpodcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.